On April 19, 1861, President Abraham Lincoln issued an executive proclamation declaring a naval blockade of those states said to be in insurrection against the U.S. government. Extended eventually from Virginia to Texas, the blockade aimed to post a competent force of naval warships to prevent ships from entering or exiting the ports of those states. The blockade was part of the so-called Anaconda Plan, the U.S. strategy to defeat the Confederate States of America by cutting it off from foreign military supplies and strangling it economically. At the time Lincoln declared the blockade, the U.S. Navy did not have a competent force to make the blockade effective. But as the war dragged on, the U.S. Navy grew dramatically and the blockade became a major threat to the new Confederacy. Recognizing this threat, Southern businessmen and the Confederate government outfitted ships specially designed to elude the tightening blockade. These ships became known as blockade runners. What makes blockade runners distinctive is the mission they had to carry goods uh, from particularly Bermuda or Nassau, and they had to elude the federal blockade. Uh, the way they did that is they were painted uh, lead gray, they had low silhouettes, they tended to be long. So everything was designed to, for speed, a lack of detection, and shallow draft so they could get into the tidal waters of the coastline of the Confederacy. And very quickly, the Confederate government sent agents to England to buy uh, uniforms, ammunition, cannon, medicine, food, bacon, things like that. That was all then brought to St. George's in Bermuda, or Nassau in the Bahamas, and then they were transshipped to blockade runners and brought in. The Army of Northern Virginia was extraordinarily dependent on the flow of all those items uh, to support it. But as the war evolved, and the uh, blockade uh, grew tighter, Wilmington became the Mecca, and it also just made sense that items that came in, it was easy to get them to a railroad uh, that went north into Richmond. John Wilkinson was typical of a whole class of young naval officers. He had been commissioned in the U.S. Navy in 1837. His father uh, was a Commodore in the U.S. Navy. He was born in Virginia, grew up in Norfolk. When the war came, with great regret and reluctance, uh, he resigned, came back to Richmond, and within short order was made a commander in the Virginia Navy. And then, in August of 1862, he began his career of blockade running. Uh, he bought the ship called the Giraffe, which was purportedly the world's fastest ship. After getting back, uh, they found out that uh, General Lee had been very successful in winning at Fredericksburg, and they rechristened the ship from the name Giraffe, uh, the ship he had purchased, to now the Robert E. Lee. And in the Robert E. Lee, over the next uh, nine months uh, or so, he ran the blockade 21 times. Uh, he ran it another seven times in other ships under his command and never touched. And the real story is the number of tactics he used to uh, run the blockade. First of all, there was a rule. You almost always ran the blockade uh, on the new moon when it would be very dark and the tides would be right. So in the middle of the day, he ran the blockade <laughs> just because that's one rule you never did. You know, you wouldn't, and sure enough, he ran right through it and nobody could catch him. He also found that when ships would run out of the blockade of the Cape Fear River, the northern frigates, what they would do is light rockets and set them off pointed in the direction of the blockade runner. So he got from New York uh, a large crate full of these same kinds of flares, and when he would run the blockade, would immediately set off a rocket at right angles to his own course, which would absolutely confuse everyone. So, he really was very good and imaginative at doing the unexpected. That's how he really was able to do, go through the blockade 28 times without being caught. I think the person who said it best was a former uh, midshipman that had served under John Wilkinson, and he said that Raphael Sims did the most harm to the enemy, 
but John Wilkinson did the most good for the Confederacy.